our community, our voice, our strength. This is actually the first inaugural summit, uh, African inaugural summit organized by the Governor's Commission on African Affairs, uh, a commission created by the Governor of the State of Maryland uh, as an advisory body on social, economic and uh, workforce issues. The goal is to bring issues that are the core of the immigrant African community here in Maryland to the forefront and also to showcase the resources that are available to them both here in the state and beyond. Governor O'Malley and Lieutenant Governor Brown are, uh, uh, who founded the uh, Governor's Commission on African Affairs are very interested in, in the work of this commission and all of our uh, uh, community initiatives and in the Sister States program and I'm happy to work with both of them on this. We're currently uh, in a process of selecting a committee to form a joint sister state committee in uh, Nigeria as well. Maryland and Africa have a, a, a unique connection. Uh, there are uh, more African Americans uh, per capita in Maryland than in most states of the United States, and uh, there are more Africans in Maryland per capita than most, most states. Uh, so uh, we have a, a connections through people, through trade, through uh, 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 international interests, so we hope to foster those through our sister state program. County Executive Leggett created uh, a few years ago an African Affairs Advisory Group to advise him on major issues for the uh, large uh, continental African population that we have uh, here in Montgomery County. And you know, it's so wonderful. People from every corner of the earth have come to Montgomery County, have come to the state of Maryland, uh, and both the governor and the county executive recognize what a great blessing that is uh, to us. It helps our economy, it enlivens our culture. We in Montgomery County have decided to have a sister city uh, with Gondar, Ethiopia. So that will be another way that we really connect with the folks who come uh, from the continent to, uh, to Montgomery County and enrich their community. The state of Maryland, uh, Governor Martin O'Malley, is the first one in the union to recognize the vitality of the new African immigrant in the state of Maryland. It's growing, it's a very growing, the new immigrants. The last census shows a tremendous amount of growth. And this community is made up of entrepreneurs, made up of uh, professors, businessmen, and average work, hard-working folks. And they're the new community into the larger, the larger society. And uh, we made ourselves present within the last 20, 30 years. In this short period of time, the African people of African continent have made a tremendous strive on their own. Economically, politically, uh, culturally, they're engaged. They're a very vital, dynamic part of our, our larger community. Recognizing that, uh, in fact, it was Ike Leggett who established the, Afri the African Advisory Board, and the governor after him established the commission to advise him on policies regarding to this particular group of people. And our goal is twofold. First and foremost, to bring the African uh, community active in the political engagement and to create resources to empower its budding economic and cultural activity. The purpose of the summit is once, in, once a year to gather the business community leaders from the African community to come together and uh, have a dialogue, to uh, discuss uh, burning issues, um, uh, uh, determine, craft our aspirations and, and, and motivate the community for active civic engagement. So the summit basically is a, a, a community gathering that allows our community to come in one place and articulate its need. We're very excited the community came. We're very excited the community had questions, very vibrant and important questions to ask. They're engaged and they look forward to many more community gatherings of that sort. So we're very uh, satisfied and pleased uh, with the outcome. This event is very important for the African uh, diaspora community. It's vital for us, especially our organization, because of our program of the immigrant community and also see how we can help also our country where we are coming from to bring together the African diaspora to dis discuss with the embassies and to put ourselves together in order to de for development our for ourselves here in uh, Maryland and also back home in our country, Africa. Whenever Africans meet or come together to deal with our issues, our problems particularly, I think it's always good. One of the mistakes that we've been making for so long is that the card before the horse approach. We have so much intellectual capacity among Africans, but then if this card stays in front of the horse, you know, uh, nothing is going to get realized. And I think this is the problem that is really been afflicting African and African people, you know. Like these borders that separate us, make us fight in isolation, 
And that way, if something happens in the Gambia, it's a Gambian problem. If something happens in Ethiopia, it's an Ethiopian problem or a Cameroonian problem. No, if something happens in Africa, it's an African problem. So we need to really expunge like these imaginary borders, you know, in our heads and, you know, physically, you know, like in the continent. Because these borders really only exist in the minds of the governments and the, the, the ones that want to keep us, you know, uh, in isolation from each other so that, you know, we cannot realize anything concrete in Africa. If we depend on these governments we know have been so corruptible, we will be forever, you know, like living in misery and poverty. But all reality, Africa is not poor. Africa is impoverished. The first thing we, we should do about Africa is a good governance. Without good governance, without uh, freedom, without elections, Africa will be the same forever. What we should do now is first to try to approach the African diasporas and tell them and empower them and then we can go to Africa. This is the greatest event I have seen towards uh, the African diaspora and the African people living around here. We have to recognize for the governor Omari for having organized this event. African Americans and the Americans have can uh, find an opportunity to do business in, uh, in Africa. They can create jobs and they can uh, improve the development of the African living here and even the African living in the African countries. You know, for the first time, you know, the African summit and we got together people from various organizations and I am the president of an organization that is titled Media for African Diaspora. Getting to meet all the members of the African diaspora to examine the various questions of interest, I think that was very interesting. We have to be engaged on mul multiple layers, on um, parallel tracks. And uh, this creates a framework where people come together. We need to do focus-driven, issue-driven uh, gathering. For instance, as far as the trade is concerned, the next one that we hope to do is a workshop where uh, policymakers, uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen from the African community, of course, also from the larger community, to sit down and government agencies to sit down and craft a way in which we can seize, uh, overcome the challenges and seize the opportunity at hand and bring concrete, advanced concrete projects and, and trade related issues. African community in North America, particularly here in the Maryland, so far they were busy trying to make a living, trying to settle down. Now that we've done that, uh, I encourage the African community to be active in civic engagement. Uh, I'd like to encourage the African community to be to uh, volunteer on organizations, uh, to exercise their uh, citizenship right, and uh, to be engaged. And uh, because it takes everybody's participation, so uh, the commission at best can create can be a catalyst agent but at the end of the day the community has to rise up to take to seize the opportunity America is still the land of opportunity people come here because they want to better their, their life to better the future generation so most of it I think is economics uh, that pushes more to come as far as the needs of uh, the uh, African community in uh, in the state of Maryland it's uh, I think it's it's wide you have uh, education that is there you have health is there, but a lot of people, what we have discovered is a lot of people comes here, they want to create business. America is a country that has been built on a business. Small business is the backbone of the economy of this country. And as Africans, we come here with diversity of experience. So we want to participate in that uh, economic development here. We can uh, also translate that uh, back home uh, in creating jobs and uh, opportunity to uh, folks back home. For many Africans who come here, most of them have a bachelor's degree. And uh, with that education, people have been impacting the economy of the, uh, of the county or uh, the state overall. You have uh, the community, Nigerian community has been creating jobs in, uh, in the state. You have the Ghanaian community, the Congolese community, the Ethiopian community. You find them everywhere. We are very economic, business-driven people, and uh, we come here and participate in uh, building a better, uh, I guess, opportunity here. There are a lot of issues and concerns that came up today, uh, and the, the things that are very, very vital to the African-American community in Maryland, the issues of trade, the issues of immigration, the issues of uh, refugee, the issues of diaspora. We are going to build on those for the next summit uh, because that was the very big goal of today's summit.
is to build on the outcome of today. So we've listened to our community, we understand their concerns, we know they want to know about trade issues in uh, Africa, we want to, they want to know about social economic issues here in Maryland and the resources available to them to grow. When we come together in these sessions, we should really, you know, take the issues, you know, like head on, you know, and um, uh, come up with some practical solutions rather than trying to sweep things under the rug. I was born in Gambia. That's that's it. After that, you know, I am an African. So whatever happens anywhere in the continent offends me. So that's that's the, that's why I think that that's the kind of mindset you know we need to cultivate now. You know, in order to solve African problems. But if we keep thinking that you know, like it's all Ethiopia, Gambia, Senegal, and things like that. It ain't never going to go nowhere. From Gambia to Senegal by air is 21 minute flight. And it costs about $300 to go there. All of these things are against us. These narrow nationalist lines, it's not going to do us any good. That's why I'm impressed. And I still think that, you know, what Nkuma said was still right. That the Ghana's independence is meaningless unless it is linked to the total liberation of African continent. African Women Council, as a non-profit organization, which have been working internationally and local. We have been also working in partnership with entrepreneurs in DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, who are looking the partnership with the American enterprises, small and medium-sized businesses. We are registered in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have base there, and we are looking to, to see how we can connect business in America, in the, especially in Maryland, and business in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo in partnership to see how we can create the economic and development and also to fight the hunger and poverty in the country. I'm seeing a lot of young people you know, in here who have the drive to uh, really solve, come up with practical solutions in reversing some of these impoverishment problems. You know, and, uh, and that gives me hope all the time. But once we fight in isolation, nothing will ever happen in the country. And then generations will come after and wonder what the hell we were doing. Everything begins with conversation. But if it ends there, then it's useless conversation. What started in New York as Occupy Wall Street on 17th of September has now moved to Washington DC in McPherson Square. Since October 1st, people have been putting up their tents and they're here to stay. This is Occupy DC. I'm here at Occupy DC because of the simple fact, America's in trouble. If we don't come together now, we're going to lose all hope and all we have is each other. This is one big family. It's not no bunch of drug addicts or alcoholics or nothing like that. This is a bunch of highly educated people. I have a full-time job, so I can't occupy. I donate food, I bring coffee, I clean up, I chop, I do what I'm told. I'm kind of hopeful that the young people are going to make the difference, that people will hear their voices and understand that this is a really important message. There are a lot of us who have jobs and pay taxes and vote, and we're here because of the message, and we're here to support that in any way we can. Okay, Basant, we have butter up here. Do we have a cooler that you want it in? Okay, I like it up here. Okay. Right now we're just uh, prepping vegetables and fruit, just having them chopped so we get ready to cook, not to chop them, but just prepared now. In the kitchen, we prepare food three times a day for everybody. 1%, 99%, everybody is welcome. We provide meals for meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. All our food is donated by private people. Sometimes some businesses might stop by and drop food off. Well, I believe people should be taxed fairly. Um, I guess the same across the board. To me, this is a true citizens movement where the citizens are coming out and, and reasserting. They're really the ultimate power in this country, not the government, the corporations, the media, the parties. I'm on the media committee, and a subgroup of that is the newspaper committee. We decided 
that we wanted to create our own publication to raise issues and just for us to get our own voice out there. I'm involved in Occupy DC because social justice is a big value of mine and the income inequality that we have in the United States has gotten to a point where it is simply injustice. I showed up and I asked how, how I could help because that's how I believe movements go forward. A grassroots movement supporting the elimination of corruption, functioning on local donations and operated by volunteers, occupiers here even have a well-stocked library. The library started actually on the first day, October 1st. Well, you can take out a book, doesn't matter what book, never bring it back, bring it back tomorrow, bring it back in an hour, a week, month. So how, long, how long do you suspect Occupy DC will be Indefinitely. No doubt. Nobody's going nowhere, even if they tear us down, we're coming back. Quote that. Welcome to Tacoma Park Farmers Market, a market stocked with local produce. It is no wonder it has been this popular for over 20 years. Open on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now let's see what the vendors have to offer. Anything from buckwheat to clover, which uh, the buckwheat tastes like molasses, and then the clover, all the way down to clover, which is a very nice and sweet, what you're used to kind of honey. We also have tupelo honey, which uh, people uh, run for. It's kind of a buttery honey. Uh, we have a goldenrod, which is very intense. We also have our beekeeper's cough, cough soother, which has lemon peel and lemon juice, and it, it just goes down very smoothly. We have some wonderful holiday flavors. The uh, spiced creamed honey has cinnamon and clove. That's delicious. My favorite would have to be the um, spiced creamed honey. We have a full array of breads. When we display at the market, we usually divide the tables. This half is all yeasted breads, and the other half is all sourdough, which is a wild yeasted bread. We have a lot of whole grain breads. One of our most popular breads is called struin, and it's a Celtic harvest bread, um, and it's made with corn, cornmeal, oats, rice, um, but there's buttermilk in it, so it makes it really nice and soft and fluffy, and um, a little bit of, of whole wheat flour, white flour, and sweetened with um, honey and a little bit of brown sugar. The people here are really neat about um, being turned on by the specialty wreaths that, that we make. They love the uh, oddball nature of some of them and the uh, grace of all of them. Generally we've got two to three sizes. Right now mostly we've got the large rings, door hangers. We grow three different kinds of peppers. We grow shishito, which is a Japanese pepper. We grow cow horn, which is an elongated pepper and it usually has a really nice curl to it. And then we grow a cayenne pepper. So they give different configurations on the wreath and also a little shadow difference in the coloring. Uh, Pearly Everlasting, that's a wild plant. We do staghorn sumac. A lot of people go, oh my God, sumac, it is not poisonous. You can actually make lemonade out of it. Well, normal lettuces are grown outdoors in the field. We grow everything in the greenhouse and hydroponics is a system of growing with the nutrient film technology. So we're growing everything indoors in a controlled environment and we're not using any pesticides. So we control the environment and you know we don't have to deal with any insects outside or animals or you know field driven issues so our boston lettuce is always the number one item that we sell and i also have romaine lettuce we sell a lettuce bouquet micro pea tendrils and a whole variety of different herbs this is our fifth season and we're here in the winter time only today we have broccoli cauliflower we've got lots of greens we got mustard turnip uh, collards kale uh, Russian kale, 
Some crops like the cooler weather. Most of the greens and broccoli and cauliflower don't like the heat of the summer. Where your beans, your corn, and tomatoes, they like the heat of the summer. So now we're into the crops that prefer the cool, cooler weather. So with our bags packed with local produce, it's been a great day here at Tacoma Park Farmer's Market. Have you got what we need? I've got some honey and cheese and the red cow. Perfect. Until next Sunday, we'll see you. Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church to join the Alternative Gift Fair, sponsored by the Alternative Gifts for Greater Washington. In this event, many organizations come together to help those in need in our local community, as well as those in countries such as Guatemala, El Salvador, Jamaica, Mali, and various other nations around the world. Now, let's join our organizations involved in this event. participating today. Uh, we have some uh, international groups uh, that are uh, serving needs overseas like we have a what group here called Bikes for the World and they take uh, used bicycles and they fix them up and they send them over to villages and towns uh, in Africa and other parts of the world uh, so people can ride them and it's really important for uh, commerce and you know being able to do shopping and things like that. What happens is that the shoppers come in and they go around the room and they talk to the different groups and they have a shopping list and it lists all the different gifts. So there's a, a, a group that works with the homeless and one of the gifts is um, an art class for some adults who are homeless and just don't have the chance to do that kind of thing. So the gift would be for supplies for the person to attend art class. We're a local organization so we particularly do things right here in Tacoma Park and nearby. Uh, we work with the seniors. Uh, we have a senior art class where we work with, we partner with the recreation department and we do art classes and the seniors lately are making glass bowls. We also did the library which brought, which the t people of Tacoma Park did it, we just organized it. But it, it brought the community together and Westmoreland Wall people worked on that and it brought the community together. Uh, my organization is called the Blue Mountain Project. Um, we're a very small nonprofit organization based in Jamaica, in um, the mountains there, where um, life is very, very different than it is in the Jamaica that most of us see on TV. The money that we are donated here goes directly into the community, so it goes to help children in Jamaica, um, it goes to help the patients that come to our medical clinics, it, it helps us do things like keep the lights on in our medical clinic, keep the electricity running, it helps us serve lunches to kids at our summer camp, and it helps us give kids um, school supplies for the year. I'm here representing the Crossroads Community Food Network, which most people in Tacoma Park probably know as the Crossroads Farmers Market. Tacoma Park is really a community that's based on being a local and sustainable space. And I think having a local food system to farmers markets in our area is a really key component of that.
kids' classes, adult classes. We have a performance calendar, so we have shows every weekend. We also have an after-school program for kids ages 6 to 13. The most important thing we do for the community is our after school care program. It's called the Energizer Club. And um, we just work with the kids after school. We help them with their homework. We have a whole life skills curriculum. So we teach them how to handle money, how to cook. We're really involved in the community. I think that this fair is all about giving back and we like to give back to the community. So. That's why we're here today. The Alternative Gifts of Greater Washington host uh, the Tacoma Park Fair every year. We always meet on the first Saturday of December and we run our fair from 12 to 4. We um, have been kindly given the space at the Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. So every year we come out, we try to decorate it and have a really fun event for folks. All of the money that um, we make from our shopping list goes directly to the charity. I think it's a really good idea to have people like come and donate money to local charities and stuff instead of giving gifts because it, it does more than just like physical gifts. It helps others. I think I'm going to try and help the, uh, the, what, the Prince George's County Animal Hospital one to help va get vac vaccinations for uh, animals. Now I'm here with Larry and Irene. Um, Larry, can you tell us something about the fair? Well, we live right down the street from this, and we feel very fortunate to be able to get things that really help people and empower people, rather than excess material goods that nobody wants. It's really uh, great that they have these opportunities for people to give people presents that are helping people who maybe won't get presents during the Christmas and holiday season. And what have you guys donated? We donated to the Bikes for the World and the Crossroads Farmers Market and Free Minds and the Homeless Children's Playtime Project. Basically, we provide services for people with mental and physical disabilities. And seeker has been around for quite some time, uh, over 20 years. And we have quite a few individuals that we provide services to. We have different types of programs. We have different departments, uh, community living department. We also have an employment services department helping individuals um, get you know, jobs and pay jobs and volunteer jobs. And we have what they call CSLA, you know, um, homes for individuals who are willing to live on their own or with some, you know, form of support. Bikes for the World, the, the main thing that we do is that we collect used bikes from people all around the Washington area and we send them to our partners overseas in developing countries mainly in Africa and in South in Central and South America and the Caribbean. I think it's a wonderful organization and I it's my main volunteer activity in the area and I work overseas in health so I, I actually go to a lot of these places and I see people riding bikes and I know how important it is. Dining for Women is the largest potluck with a purpose. We have 200 chapters worldwide dedicated to eradicating extreme poverty in women and children. And every month we support a different organization benefiting women and children. This month we support Muso Mali. It's a microfinance organization that is not about only the loan, but about economic sustainability, women's empowerment, community change, eradicating malaria. It covers every topic so that when the women are a part of this program, it transforms lives. It transforms their children's lives and it transforms the community's lives. It sounds like you have a big scope of help that you're giving to the, everyone, that people in, in these other countries that need help. How have you seen that your help and benefit have reached them? How have you seen them a progress and benefit themselves from all the help that you have done? Well, before uh, Dining for Women, worked with Muso Mali, the women had no jobs. They didn't, they had no source of income. So when you go from nothing to a source of income that is sustaining yourself and your family and the community, it's everything. They call us light because they believe they now have light in their lives because they have received a microfinance loan. It's also saving lives because someone told me recently that you can die of malaria in two days. And so they are going around and educating these women about 
the dangers of malaria and how to eradicate it in their kids and their own lives. So it's powerful. We try to inspire the youth that's in the D.C. jail system. Our main focus is in D.C. A lot of these guys, no younger than 16, no older than 17, we try to you know, even though they're going through what they're going through, despite it, we still try to inspire them. How they received it? Well, I can say from my own experience, because at one time, uh, you know, 10 years ago, um, I was in the program, and, you know, I'm like one of the oldest members. You know, I always knew what I wanted to do in life, whatever, you know, I got caught up, you know, doing the wrong thing, you know, got arrested and went to prison, so this organization came about. The program promised me, you know, once I get out, they'll still, you know, give me more help if you know that help was needed. The program pretty much encouraged me to, to move forward on with my life and you know. So that sounds like it's giving a second chance to all of those that that could really use one and it sounds from we have a someone who personally has has benefited from this and it shows that he is helping the community and that he has grown from this program and the help that they give. women and children in rural Latin America, specifically in El Salvador and in Guatemala. We support the women and children through education and training, so we help women learn a trade, like sewing or uh, word processing, and um, we help them, uh, we help their children stay in school. of our younger participants. Um, can you tell us what you think about the fair? Well, I think it's great that people are raising money for um, people who need it. What do you think? Well, I think it's great. Like, last year there was something like, um, like there was playing a tree in Haiti. Like, you could buy a tree to plant in Haiti. I mean, you don't go in Haiti, but still. But you can buy a plant. Plantation. I mean, not a plantation, but you can, yeah. And it's also a great present for your parents or your aunts and uncles or your grandparents because it's cousins, cousins, because it's from you and it helps out people who are in need. So can you tell me if you guys have donated anything? Well, not really because we just came. Yeah, we just came. But um, last year we did. Yeah. Last year we, for Christmas, we gave my mom and dad trees for to plant in Haiti. Yeah, and also stuff like that. Thank you, sounds good. During this the holiday season, we really like to encourage people to take the stress and the stuff out of holidays and really focus on people, caring for others, um, and taking time to be with family and loved ones. Okay, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Well, it's been a fun day at the Alternative Gift Fair, don't you think, Kevin? It was. It was really exciting and interesting seeing all the community and all the organizations come together to raise awareness and money for those in need, not only locally, but also in other nations around the world. Well, we hope you had fun and you come next year, the first Saturday of December. Don't miss out. The apricot tree, also referred to as a fruitful alliance, is an eco fairy tale for all times, especially ours. It is a story about a small group of people who have come together to regain the control as well as to save their environments for a better cause. I did a painting of a giraffe, it's done on the show. And from the painting, I did another painting. Um, it was this one here. And then I came up with the idea, why not, write a, why not do a book? So then once the idea was beginning and expressed to the director and other people in the studio, we all collaborated together. And I did the illustrations. And we all had ideas about what would be shown and what wouldn't be. And we built a storyline from that. 
and the person who wrote the story was Claudia Cusset. Shannon and I, the other artist, he did those pictures and I wrote a story to go with them. Turned out to be a funny fairy tale. So we thought, why not try and publish it and see if we could sell it. And that's how, very simple how it came to be. The Apricot Tree is a story that Shannon and Claudia wrote together. It's a traditional fairy tale where the animals are living peacefully in the kingdom. Suddenly, their peaceable kingdom is threatened by an evil witch named Wilhelmina. But at the last minute, she's saved by Giselle the gazelle, who has lightning rods coming out of her horns. And it turns the evil Wilhelmina into a beautiful princess called Gaia, which means Earth. And the Earth Gaia princess and all the creatures of the kingdom and all the people come back together. The apricot tree is saved, and the kingdom is saved. This is very different from the others. The artists have a mission, the, the, the organization that hosts the artists have a broader mission for connecting arts with mental health. Well, there's just a whole community of support behind them that comes also with this exhibit. Educating the Tacoma Park community that there is such a place as Creates Art Center where people can come and create art and get some recognition and perhaps sell some art and some books. I grew up on a farm when I was a little kid, had a lot of different animals. Decided to do a painting of the giraffe and then it just led on to other animals. And I've drawn animals before. They're a big part of my uh, artwork. I want to say all of my artwork, but it's a big part of it. And it's just fun to do. I like um, doing pictures that are expressive about what I'm feeling. A lot of them have to do with the illness I have, schizophrenia. Like this one, like I tend to, uh, with the eyes, you know, like paranoid thoughts and stuff. Shannon and Claudia are always painting, and Claudia is always writing. They also share the fact that their art has been their salvation. It has literally kept their voices away from them, and, their, and it has calmed their symptoms greatly. And the work that comes out of them is just increasingly more imaginative and free. Their art and their friendship really helps them connect to each other, to the world. It makes them laugh, it makes them happy, and it, now it's bringing pleasure to other people, which is a great joy for all of them. I am happy for a turnout. Those who are coming about to see the artwork, I hope they get here and I hope they enjoy themselves a whole lot. I hope all the artwork, I hope it makes, it makes their day a better day as they, because they came to see what was going on. friends and just walking around. Well, I sort of like seeing all the costumes and stuff and of course like trick-or-treating. You'll get candy and, and you get to stay up at night. Just like getting the candy. We're characters from a fairy book. I'm Rachel. Jack Frost is in this book. This is a goblin. Jack Frost is helper. Yeah. The fairy's magical uh, objects. And then Kirsty and Rachel help them get the bag. So they open the locket and there's fairy dust, and they take them out and they sprinkle it over their house and then they turn into fairy. We've done like family themes for, gosh, probably 10 years now. It's a lot of fun to, to put them together and come up with ideas. The, it's the most fun putting the costumes together, I think. It's like a bonding experience. So I'm Ants in the Pants. And the villain is Kerplunk. He's money, Zach is money bags. 
Mom is, is the Scrabble board, and Carolyn's Twister, and Jessica is, is uh, Uno. Netflix envelope. She wanted to be popcorn, so I decided to be the movie for the popcorn. First, I got this dress that I had, and then this leotard, I put it under. I put it under the dress, and then I put my wings on and my and my shoes. I am a cowboy. I'm really enjoying this, and I think it's really fun. I am a vampire. I'm Medusa. I'm a rock star. I'm a witch. Can't you see? <laughs> We have her name Draculara, and she is the daughter of Dracula. We had a wig, but it was way too scratchy, so we decided to put our hair pink. Because I didn't have any costume with, with the short hair I have. Look how short hair I have. And I'm a girl. This is real. <laughs> well, we braided my hair, and we bent it in like pipe cleaners, and then we stapled snake heads onto it, and the end is like the tongue. I'm wearing a ninja suit because ninjas are cool. Ah, uh, Hello Kitty. I'm wearing a ninja suit. Ninjas are awesome. I think it says got busted on the back. I didn't know what to do when I bought this costume like a couple months ago and I finally convinced my mom to buy these cuffs. Candy? I really like candy corn. I like lollipops. I also like gum, and I like Laffy Taffy. Let me think. Gummy bales. Probably the um, Rice Krispies the best. M&M. M&M. I like Laffy Taffy chocolate. <laughs> yeah, chocolate. Probably candy corn. Um, I've gotten candy corn, I've gotten Snickers, I've gotten Milky Way and all kinds. I sort of like Tootsie Rolls. My favorite kind of candy? Milky Ways. I like that I get those candies and stuff. Probably zombies. <laughs> Afraid of a lion? Because they eat our brains and they eat us. Because it has ways of sharp teeth. Monsters? Probably the monsters. Nothing. Because they're not really scary, they're just sort of weird. Maybe clowns, because they're so weird. <laughs>